Okay, um, uh, uh, so I'm going to be talking today about um, a topic which is uh, really intimately connected with uh, turbulent mixing um, in this sort of theme of this uh, conference. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, show you some uh, very unique experiments we're trying to do in uh, plasmas where we can study thermal mixing, uh, for example, in very controlled conditions. And I want to acknowledge my collaborators, a couple of graduate students that are involved in the project uh, uh, from my institution, Scott Karbyshewski and Matt Paulus from UCLA. And we're also working together with uh, Professor Morales and, and Dr. Von Campanella. So first of all, I'm just going to try to uh, motivate this by uh, trying to explain uh, what we mean by filament, filaments, plasma filaments, magnetized. We'll be looking at magnetized plasma, so the filaments will be uh, in the regime where uh, charged particles in the filaments are basically uh, guided by magnetic fields and involving electric fields. And so I'll try to go through some of the basic physical processes, um, the transport physics, essentially, we're trying to understand transition from classical transport to uh, anomalous or uh, transport driven by collective processes. And, um, and then we'll try to go into sort of the new, new regimes we're trying to access, and that's uh, situations where you can have actually filament-filament uh, -filament interaction, and we can build structures uh, that are basically uh, complex, uh, can, can generate quite complex patterns, and, and we can study, for example, things like chaotic heat flow in, in quite, uh, quite a bit of detail. So um, here's kind of uh, the working definition of a plasma filament um, is that it's a coherent mesoscale plasma structure that's uh, strongly aligned to a magnetic field. And so mesoscale here would be, um, you know, plasma, magnetized plasma typically has scales like the uh, gyro radius of the electrons, say gyro radius of the ions, uh, collisionless skin depth, C over omega P for the species. And so uh, we'll be studying mesoscale structures so that we're talking about plasma filament structures that are sort of on the order of the uh, uh, collisionless skin depth or gyro radius of the, of the ions or a little bit larger. So that's what we call mesoscale. Um, microscale would be, you know, sub, uh, subscales below the electron inertial, the C over mega P collisionless skin depth scale. So, bank, so filaments are... Filamentary structures are typically observed in boundary layers of plasmas, uh, as uh, George McGee was, was explaining, um, that uh, you, know, the, you, have core, you have core turbulence, for example, but you also have boundary uh, turbulence, and some of the boundary turbulence observed in, in uh, magnetically confined plasmas contain these filamentary structures, which I'm gonna be talking about. And of course, filamentary structures are found in many plasma environments, for example, stellar atmospheres. I'll try to show you some example. And so we would like to basically study um, the transport physics associated with filaments because if they can uh, often carry large amounts of heat and particles. And so, uh, and their transport theory is not just simply uh, uh, dictated by a fixed law. Uh, so the transport theory for these could be, uh, is much more involved and, and, and involves non-local effects. So I'll just show you a couple examples of the types of filamentary structures we're kind of interested in studying, why we study magnetized plasma filaments. So just, I just pull out uh, other literature, just a very couple examples um, that uh, were actually, these structures have been imaged in quite a bit of detail with very, very high speed cameras, for example. So here's a, an example of a magnetized toroidal plasma, more spherical like, um, uh, it's a plasma, uh, that is uh, at the Pros Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory called NSTX. And there's a similar uh, toroidal device called MAST in the UK, which uh, has very similar characteristics. And both of these are experiments that are studying uh, filamentary structures in particular and, and the transport associated with them. So that's why I kind of use those as examples. So for example, here's an, uh, um, a high-speed video image of um, um, one of these sort of spherical-like plasmas, which um, um, evolves, and then there's a formation of so-called ELMs, edge-localized mode. So these are kind of occurring near the boundary of the plasma. And you can see this 
filamentary structure kind of winding around the, the, the plasma device, uh, sort of toroidally. And um, here's kind of another picture of it, um, sort of the time evolution sequence of the de development of these filamentary structures. Um, and, uh, and then here is some modeling of those using uh, fluid, fluid models um, to, to, to describe sort of the characteristic length scale. As, as they wind around many times around the device, these things could be many meters long, for example. And they're fairly highly long, uh, aligned with the magnetic field, as I was trying to explain earlier. And here's another example from um, the NSTX plasma at Princeton. For example, um, they can image um, the uh, formation of the filaments at the boundary layer of the plasma. And so you can see a time sequence here of uh, the development of it. They, they call it a blob, but it's actually more what we call a blob, blob filament because actually this thing has very elongated structure. But it, if you look in a plane, it looks like a blob, right? So, so sometimes they're called blob, uh, blob structures. But basically, they have a lot of dynamics. And you can imagine those, these blobs, blob filaments, they will be carrying uh, heat and particles out as they sort of you know, shed uh, away from the boundary, boundary layer of the plasma. So these structures are quite important in terms of the overall transport um, of heat and particles from the, from the edge region to, to the outer, outer layer, of the outer uh, boundaries of the plasma. And just one more example, this is kind of um, uh, connected with uh, experiments at uh, General Atomics. Uh, for example, you can sort of see the um, uh, development here of these so-called edge localized modes, which are essentially um, filamentary structures in both density and temperature. So, you're, so we're sort of looking at profiles across the boundary, the edge of the plasma, and you can see here um, sort of structures, so the, the you know, elevation of the density above the background is you know, quite significant here. So here's a, here's a filament in density. And then if you look at the temperature, uh, you also see temperature filaments as well. So there's temp, temp, you could think of this as being a kind of a lot of uh, you know, fluctuations that involve uh, filamentary structures of temperature and density. And of course, we can go to the solar surface, for example, and we can see uh, beautiful images from in uh, uh, extreme ultraviolet light. Um, uh, we can see that also the plasma structures, the magnetic arches, have very uh, kind of filamented structures. Um, and, uh, and these things are very dynamic. And, and the main thing here is that the, the luminosity along any of these arches is very non-uniform. So there's a lot of um, possibilities that the, the distribution of the of the, um, of the heat and the, and the particles is, is, is very, very non-uniform non in, the, in the magnetic arches, for example. So these are just some examples of filamentary structures. And here, in this case, there'll be multiple filaments uh, interacting. OK, so what we want to do is take uh, that, sort of, uh, those, that, uh, that sort of background of filamentary structures in the magnetized plasma. And we want to see if we can actually isolate filaments. So, we would like to make the filament in a linear device so we don't have the effects of curvature as we have in the toroidal plasma. So we want to make long filaments, um, linear filaments, and just study, for example, the fluctuations and in waves internal, internal to those filaments and then see how, how we can characterize the transport physics and also the modes. Because you can think of filaments as sort of like an antenna. If you can actually develop modes, internal modes, through gradients, for example, this thing will be radiating. We want to know like the near field of, the, of this filament antenna, if you will, and also some of the far field effects. Where, uh, so to see how non-locality is, how much non-locality effects come into play. So here's a cartoon of what we want to set up. Um, and it has been studied uh, in the lab uh, since the late 1990s, early 2000, uh, 2000s in the large plasma device at UCLA, which Walter Geckman gave a, an excellent sort of introduction to things you can do. So um, what we want like to do is create a filament that's far away from the boundaries. And also, the filament should be isolated. And so it should not be in contact with, say, um, the anode where you're sort of biasing. Uh, if, you, if this is your cathode source, we would like to have the filament have a finite length, for example. So 
um, what, we're, what we're attempting to do is basically um, uh, create a filament which is, and has an elevated temperature above a background. So typically we work with a background plasma which is cold, like a quarter of an electron volt. So that's almost the energies of, that you'd find like in a solid, for example. Um, and then we would have um, an, a heated region which is about, say, 20 times larger, so we get a very good contrast. And um, this filament would be, uh, have the very large gradients if we could localize it in space. And then we could study, for example, the, the uh, normal modes associated with that filament. So here we study uh, in plasmas which have a relative you know, density of like 10 to the 12 um, particles per cubic centimeter. And this is, say, studied in helium, but we could study these in hydrogen or other plasmas. And so, um, so this is the kind of thing that we set up. So what, we'd have, what we first need is a heat source a good heat source that's very controllable. And, um, and so what we're going to show you now is basically how we actually make the filament from a, from a particular heat source, which provides us with a, a kind of an electron beam. And um, if the plasma is, is, you know, of this density, the mean free path of the charge, uh, mean free path of the particles, electrons, for example, is rather short. It's about like 10 to 15 centimeters. But this filament is like 10 meters long. So, uh, what will happen is if we have a beam launched into that plasma, the beam will slow down and thermalize, and the energy uh, will, will basically be transported classically along the field line if there's no uh, like a wave processes. And so then we'll get a very nice sort of uh, very clean sort of uh, temperature filament. This is what we're uh, attempting to do here, so just the pure energy transport. So the gradients of density will be very, very mild and we'll have just everything from, uh, coming from mostly the, the thermal uh, components. Okay, so Walter has already uh, explained the large plasma device and others in Chris, Chris Neiman's talk as well. So we do the experiments here in um, the uh, uh, chamber, the, and, and length here is very important, and, and this motivates, this, this work will motivate the reason why we need to do this in a very long chamber. You think, well, why don't we just do this in a very small plasma? Why do we have to have such 18 meter long plasmas? So I'll explain that in a moment, why, why we do need that very, uh, uh, the, the length and, and also the, uh, the very, very large diameter. So the main plasma is created in this barium oxide cathode and it's uh, pulsed every, every one second and Plasmas are, again, uh, magnetized, so one kilogauss magnetic field, as I, I told you, the density. And the electron, uh, the, ra the beta, uh, the ratio of electron, um, the thermal, uh, thermal pressure to the uh, magnetic pressure is rather small. It's like 10 to the minus 4. So it's a low, low, considered low, be low beta plasma. And we work in a particular... Uh, phase of that discharge. So when the plasma is turned on, that barium oxide source is turned on, you have this uh, background plasma, and then the main plasma source is turned off, and then what happens is you get what's called an afterglow. And in this afterglow region is the, is the region we want to work in because we can then turn on a heat source in this afterglow region when the plasma is very cold. So here's the kind of profile of after the main plasma source is turned off, then uh, there's a, a slow decay of the density and almost no decay, well, very little decay of the temperature, okay? And so uh, we have basically about 15 milliseconds of time to actually put in a heat source and study the waves, which are processes which are occurring on microsecond time scales, for example. So, so this is the important point. And so we get basically this one quarter of an electron volt. This is electron temperature versus time in units of electron volt. So it's here. And we also have to pay attention that the density is changing over the time scale, but we want to work over time scales where the density change is, is rather modest. Okay, so the heat source. So now we've got our background plasma uh, that's really cold, and now we have to make, make it warm, heat it up. And so what we use, um, so there are a couple of uh, different uh, ways we can in introduce the heat source. So the heat source we could make very small heat sources um, using these so-called lanthium hexaboride crystals, which give us a heat source that's a scale of about a few millimeters. Um, and then we can also use another larger, say, 10 centimeter diameter uh, lanthium hexaboride uh, 
uh, source to actually make filaments that are actually much larger in scale. But we're going to talk, and mostly I'll talk today about the small, the small heat, uh, lo very localized heat source. And so what we do is we um, introduce this um, crystal into the plasma at some region, and then we bias it relative to some anode. Um, now, Walter described flux rope experiments. Now, those biases are like 100 plus 200, 100, or 100 to 200 volt biases. So here, we want to make the filament a finite length, so we have to do low biasing, uh, and that, the biases on this uh, crystals are typically like about 10 to 50, 10 to 20 volts in that range. If you bias above 20 volts, then you start ionizing helium, uh, uh, and so then you have to worry about the density uh, changes in the discharge. Okay, so when you actually introduce that um, lanthium hexavite crystal as your heat source, again, as I just explained the thermalization, then you get this nice um, kind of uh, thermal filament, and I'll explain like how we can control the length. Um, but basically, here's the, this looks like a kind of Gaussian looking uh, thermal profile. Here's the, uh, this is a, taken at a plane a few, uh, few meters away from the source. And so in a plane, we kind of uh, use probes to kind of create a map of the, um, ion, the, the, the uh, saturation current. And saturation current is actually proportional to density and uh, square root of electron temperature. But the density here, we, you, we can separate these quantities. Um, and, and actually, this, if you, when, I, when I show these maps, you can think of these as almost purely coming from the temperature, not, not so significantly varying from the density is almost a constant. Over this, uh, over this size of a, the filament. So here's a nice sort of localized Gaussian filament that we, and this, these kind of experiments were, like, as I say, done before, and we're building upon them. Now, the other way we can make larger filaments is to actually use a larger lanthium hexavalent uh, source. So this is a, a disc about uh, 10 centimeters or so in size. And so that um, can actually be used to make uh, temperature filaments where, where, where we're working more on the centimeter scale, not the millimeter scale, as I've been explaining. And so the nice thing about this technique with masks, um, with this larger source, is you can put a mask in front of it, and then you can actually make controlled, uh, controlled sort of uh, uh, thermal structures. So, for example, I'm, I'm going to show you here... Um, and the result, if you put a mask and you, you drill uh, three holes, and then you can vary the spacing so you can make multiple masks. And here you can see that uh, we can form three filaments. Um, and this kind of idea came from Walter Geckelman's experiments in flux ropes, where they use a similar technique to create multiple flux ropes. Walter showed some nice examples of two flux ropes, but he's done three flux ropes. And so here, the mask method, we can drill an arbitrary number of holes, and well, not arbitrary, but some finite number of holes, and we can actually make many, we can make dozens of filaments. Uh, of course, depending on the size of the hole, the size of the filament can be like small scale or, or larger scale. So, so this is a, another, a second method uh, that we can use to create uh, filament structures. And we also built uh, uh, masks where we can actually make a ring shape a heat source so this is uh, um, some work that we did uh, with Bart and creating a, a ring shape, a hollow profile um, of the temperature. And so we were studying uh, various kinds. We, we observed very interesting phenomena associated with intermittent uh, transport and, and uh, also avalanche type, thermal avalanches. So I won't go into those, but just to show you the capability that you can make um, more or less uh, designer uh, filaments. Okay, so previous work was using these uh, localized, like these uh, lab, lanthium hexavalent crystals. They were used previously for studying fundamental uh, uh, tra tra you know, transitions from a uh, classical collisional transport in a plasma to, to uh, anomalous transport where we had, uh, from the gradients, they drive the fluctuations in the waves and those would be um, an addition to the to classical effects. And so um, the other element of this work is that if you have like the steep uh, temperature or pressure gradients in the plasma, you can actually drive um, alphane, shear alphane modes, uh, 
And just to remind you, Cheryl Fane mode is basically a perturbation that is uh, uh, perpendicular to the main magnetic field. So it's driven by parallel currents, but the, these induce perturbations in the magnetic field perpendicular to the main field. This is so-called line bending uh, perturbation, which propagates just like when you, when you pluck a guitar string. You can think of that as a, as a, as a Cheryl Fane mode equivalent in a plasma. So, um, so yeah, so this is the kind of uh, physics we've been investigating with these experiments. So first of all, let me just um, explain to you a, a single filament, and then we'll just discuss the uh, situation with multiple filaments. So if you have a single filament, um, how, do you, how, do you, um, how, how can you sort of characterize it um, through sort of classical transport theory? So basically, um, filament length control is determined by the ratio of the perpendicular heat diffusivity and the, to the parallel heat diffusivity. Obviously, in a magnetized plasma, the parallel diffusivity along the field is much, uh, much higher than the perpendicular. It just in classical uh, processes where we have just, say, electron ion collisions or some collisional transport is dominant. So basically, the, the size, the, the length of the filament, you can control it mainly by, by adjusting these perpendicular and parallel transport coefficients, those collisional ones. And so if you just sort of go into uh, any standard textbook description of transport in a magnetized plasma with just uh, collisions, electron ion collisions dominantly, you see uh, how they scale, how these parallel and perpendicular transport coefficients scale. So if you just go down to the bottom here, the parallel uh, thermal diffusivity scales uh, roughly like temperature to the 5 halves power. However, the perpendicular component, because you have, you know, electrons are magnetized, they scale like uh, the inverse of the magnetic field squared and the electron temperature square root. So based on these uh, scalings, you can then organize the ratio of this kappa parallel over kappa perp, and then that's how you can uh, then work out what the length of the filament will be, right? By just adjusting the magnetic field and electron temperatures, that's how we actually get the length. That's, how, that's why the length is 10 meters in the way we designed the parameters for those five electron volts, for example, case. So that's really, um, this, this works very, very well. We could predict very accurately from classical theory at least the length of a filament. And so here's kind of, a, and then, you know, that's, that's just a simple heat equation, but if you couple it to the continuity equation, so equation for density and momentum equation, and if you uh, include the heat source here, um, and, uh, you know, so these are called the so-called Braginsky equations, the, and, and if, you, uh, if you sort of uh, solve those equations, you can actually predict the length based on the, the properties of your heat source. So, for example, early time and then late time, this is your steady state filament. So in this case, this is an eight, eight, eight meter long filament, uh, which we goes along with those sort of predictions back of the envelope. Okay, now that's the classical picture. Now the wave picture, um, you have basically fluctuations um, that develop from the steep plasma, the temperature gradients. And so here's a um, kind of early work that characterized this transport from, uh, from classical when the filament is getting set up, and then when the gradients are sufficiently steep. So here's a plot of like the electron temperature Right, here's the filament, and if you take the profile, the, the radially uh, azimuthal average profile, you see here it's, it's got a very steep gradient here, and that drives fluctuations, like really large. And these are on the order of tw uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 kilohertz type fluctuations. And they start, of course, diffusing. Uh, they contribute to the to perpendicular, uh, so anomalous thermal diffusivity. And so, um, and so here's kind of um, now point, point measurement. So if you, there's actually uh, several modes that are very important here. Uh, so this, if you actually are sitting uh, just at the region where the gradient is maximum, you get these uh, M equal one type modes. That's this red here. And these frequencies are uh, uh, on order of 30 kilohertz or so. And then actually at the very center of the filament, you get these um, lower frequency oscillations, which are about five, to eight kilohertz, and those are um, essentially, the filament acts like a, a, a thermal resonator. So basically you have sound waves which are basically trapped in this thermal, mo this, this thermal filament, and then this, um, 
this creates this low frequency oscillation, which actually we're still trying to understand. We don't have a full picture of how that works, but we, uh, we, we, uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, it's, it's easily, easily observed in the experiments. And then outside the filament, you get these spikes, which are actually sort of Lorentzian pulses, which Walter had talked a bit at the end, toward the end of his talk. And so uh, that shows that these are kind of far field effects, because we're kind of now, as you move out, you can actually see some of these, these pulses. And so when we put multiple filaments, like uh, filaments near each other, then these interaction of Lorentzian pulses is, is kind of what we're trying to understand. So just a kind of a quick physical picture of this uh, electron temperature instability. So essentially, when you have a temperature gradient, so here's one filament with a, a, a thermal gradient, um, and here's a magnetic field. So what happens is that um, you have a perturbation. Um, so this is the, the shaded part is, is hot, and this is cold. And so you get basically electric potential uh, fluctuation, which um, is in phase with the electron temperature fluctuation. And so you get this kind of uh, electron diamagnetic drift effect. But then um, uh, you, uh, if, the, if the phase relation between potential and, and temperature is not, um, if, if it's finite, then uh, from coupling to the parallel dynamics, you can actually get this perturbation to amplify. This will grow and this will, uh, this will decrease here. So you get basically a kind of like an interchange-like type of mode, uh, and that this is the origin of this drift alphane fluctuation. So parallel dynamics couples to this perpendicular dynamics. And if, you, if you're a fluid, if you're a fluid uh, theorist or experimentalist, you're probably familiar with the Peclet number. So Peclet numbers for the kind of plasmas, which, which is the rate of advection to heat diffusion. So if you kind of uh, use the E cross B motion, that's how the plasma really mo moves in a perpendicular direction to the magnetic field. This Peclet number is, scales something like the collisionality times the fluctuation and so typically these are around 3 to 30. So we're in a high, uh, greater than one Peclé number where advection kind of dominates. So I'll just kind of go to, well, um, yeah, so basically we've been, model, we, we've been able to successfully model these, uh, in, these temperature gradient instabilities and uh, I'll just kind of go to sort of the simulations. These are basically um, simulations based on the uh, so-called gyrokinetic equations, which uh, gyrokinetic description of plasma is it's like an E cross B, each charged particle is sort of E cross B drifting. And we solve this uh, kinetically uh, for, with millions of particles. And here's a, plane, uh, a, a cross section of the electric potential which develops in time. And we see the M equal one mode pattern consistent with what we see in the experiments. But we also see smaller scale features and that's connected with convective cells which are purely, uh, uh, th these are essentially uh, k, k peril equals zero or um, actually average sort of modes that are, that are present. So they, they relax the temperature profile. There's some simulation showing the relaxation of the temperature from these, uh, these uh, temperature gradient driven modes. So I'll just go now to the multiple filament experiments. That'll be, this is my ending here. So basically what we're now trying to do is uh, do experiments where we have uh, multiple filaments, like, and we started with three, and uh, our goal is to study sort of nonlinear convective transport and presence of uh, fluctuating magnetic fields. If they're close enough, the field lines can become stochastic and uh, nonlinear E cross B convection. So what we do is we put now, we introduce into the plasma not just one uh, heat source, but we introduce three. So we put these, uh, crystals on a probe drive, on three probe drives, and here we can make them arbitrary close, from this close to arbitrary separation, and the, each crystal is on a separate electronic, so basically we can bias each crystal independently, and, um, and, and so we can say, for example, have one bias to say 15 volts, and then these would be biased to say uh, 4 volts, for example. So, so the, this is the view down the machine when you put the crystals on these probe drives, and then we can just move them spatially in uh, uh, close together or far apart. And so here's, an, uh, yeah, that's just a single heat source. But here if we have uh, the three, so we started off with a far separation, 
Um, so again, this is the te electron temperature, essentially. Um, each of the, the three crystals, are, they're biased the, the same amount in this case. So we get the five electron volt peak temperatures here. And then we see that um, there's actually convective tails. So the, these, surprisingly, even though these are very far apart, there are many gyro radii or skin depth apart, we still get actually interaction uh, between the filaments. So a, a, a single filament, if we turn these two off, a single filament would just have a nice, a nice sort of uh, Gaussian type shape, uh, whereas now we sort of get uh, interaction. And so here's the fluctuations in the, temp in the uh, saturation curtain, so it's fluctuation in temperature, and we see modes that develop, like mode uh, one, uh, M equal one, M equal two modes that develop around each of these filaments. And so there's a symmetry breaking. These, these offer a symmetry breaking perturbation, so now these, uh, this, the mode structure around here is, is not as uh, the same as that, as that structure there. And so what we see is that we put the filaments very close together, we form a very uh, complex structure, but then there's an outer gradient that forms because the inside is relaxed very quickly and we build up an outer, outer uh, gradient. And so here's just a, uh, we've been modeling this with, again, Braginsky transport equations and, and trying to study the nonlinear convective transport. So just in summary, we've made isolated uh, uh, magnetized uh, electron temperature filaments various sizes, using crystals from a few millimeters to, and then with masks on larger cathode, we can make a uh, centimeter scale or even larger. Um, and uh, the um, close case case patterns, we tend to get um, very sort of chaotic cross field transport, enhanced uh, E cross B uh, flows and uh, convective tails. And so what we're trying to actually do is characterize uh, these structures as the so-called Lagrangian coherent structures. And I, it's kind of interesting because the, 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 the turbulent mixing, the, the logo is actually a Lagrangian coherent structure where you actually see large convective tails. In this case, they're using four filaments and we're using three in a triangular pattern, if you will. So we can try to make sort of fluid analogs uh, in, in, in uh, these magnetized plasmas. So thanks very much for listening.